I'm Jay Moran. I'm Bridget Jaipal Valenza. I'm Thomas O'Neill White. I'm Angelie Preston. We need to get together and let our voices be heard. This is What's Next. A dedicated hour to have important conversations about the issues facing the marginalized and underrepresented communities of Western New York and Southern Ontario. We're gonna have some real healing. We've gotta have space to tell some uncomfortable truth. What's Next continues our mission to discuss race, equity, and the common concerns of Buffalo's East Side and beyond. In the suburban area everywhere, we must work and teach our children. This is What's Next here on WBFO. Joining us now is Lacey Kiefer Wilson. She's the Public Health Director of Chautauqua County. Lacey, thank you very much for being with us. Thanks for having me today, Patrick. So you took over uh, as Chautauqua County Public Health Director at the top of this year. Um, Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, You had served in an interim role before that since November of 2022. And then before that, you had worked in the County Office for Aging Services. You've focused on nutrition, wellness, um, Commission on Rural Resources for New York State. So part of uh, me listing all these things is, you know, you've had a lot of different um, experience and served a lot of different communities and populations. So I'm kind of curious, you know, in your role now, spanning all of that, um, what do you see as are the most pressing needs of the people in the communities uh, across Chautauqua County? Really, it's, I consider it a, a privilege to work in, in this area and, and um, really serve our community in this way, because of course we have challenges and there are barriers and, you know, we're experiencing a number of different public health issues, but there's so many assets in this community as well. So, you know, as I talk about, um, you know, some of the areas that we're struggling, we do have all of the underpinnings, uh, you know, of just those community connections neighbors and people who really care about each other and organizations that reflect, you know, that value of, of love and support as well, that really makes the work that we do um, an easier lift. But, you know, we, we are experiencing and, you know, have experienced a number of different public health issues, things from, you know, emerging issues that we've seen over the last couple of decades, like, of course, you know, substance abuse issues and addiction. Um, But then the longer standing, more chronic disease related um, issues that we have, you know, but we're really no different in a number of ways in Chautauqua County than what we see across the nation, just in terms of a move away from the smaller centered, you know, community into more sprawling suburban lifestyle, you know, so cars replaced walking and biking. Um, We do much less, you know, physical activity and movement than we have before. Um, And of course, those create access barriers as well. And and then that's when we see kind of the proliferation of some of those other issues around substance abuse, lack of access to, you know, consistent preventive care, um, food insecurity, and those types of things. Yeah. And and that's a, that's a point that I wanted to bring up as well. You know, you mentioned people being physically spread out and in a more car dependent society, you know, leading to health issues, but also mental health issues as well. Is there a particular challenge in a community or, or in a county where, the care is maybe has to be more centralized just because of of locations um, while a population is actually more spread out are there particular challenges to that as opposed to you know um, locations where populations are you know are are, are more dense or more centrally located yeah no and that's that's a great point and a a really astute observation of you um, because we we kind of deal with this interesting dichotomy in in Chautauqua County, where we do have um, semi-populated, you know, quote unquote, urban centers here um, in our North County and our South County with the cities of Dunkirk and Jamestown. Um, And then yet surrounding those areas, you have kind of, you know, that typical suburban sprawl. And then we have very rural areas, you know, as part of our county too. And and really the most um, part of our landmass in Chautauqua County is very is very rural. Um, So we have to really be creative in terms of our solutions and, um, you know, the options that we're going to look toward in the future, because it's not a one size fits all here. So while the transportation issues, you know, in Jamestown um, may be 
very cohesive and, and we can serve you know the population there in a very cohesive way. That looks very different when we move out into some of the other more rural parts of our county like Rockton or Forestville or Clymer. The same types of models you know won't work there in that in, in those types of um, you know landscapes. So it takes a lot of um, creativity. Um, it takes a lot of you know knowledgeable people and community members who are engaged that we can talk to and, and um, really get feedback on what it is that they're lacking and what it is also that they have that we can capitalize on those assets to um, really make those connections and, and bring the delivery of services in a more efficient way. I'm particularly curious about you know your plans because in um, there's sort of an announcement of your appointment in the role talk of of fortifying the programs, the services, and the preparedness. The preparedness kind of stuck out to me because I'm wondering in the past like five years or so, there obviously we've dealt with COVID and that it was dealt with very differently um, based on, you know, the needs of populations as well as like, you know, geographic locations and, and kind of populations like we were talking about, but also just, you know, you mentioned, you know, chronic issues of disease and things like that. And as we're learning more about those things from researching, what, what is the prepared? I mean, what is the focus on when it comes to preparedness? Is it preparing? Is it preparing against, a, the, you know, a, a possible future pandemic? Like, what is that? What does that kind of look like um, in terms of your work in Chautauqua County? So if we were to do it very well, um, it would be preparing for everything from, you know, the mitigating and preventing you know, these lifestyle uh, chronic diseases to um, preparedness for and a readiness for emergencies and emerging issues like we see and have seen with COVID-19, H1N1, um, and even environmental um, disasters, you know, that we are accustomed to here um, in Chautauqua County as well. You know, we've had flooding, um, you know, issues and things in the past. Of course, our winters, you know, take a toll. So really what it is, is it's a, it's a comprehensive and systems mindset and approach to the way that we build partnerships in the community and the way that we plan. Um, so, you know, taking making a concerted effort not to plan in silos. So we talk a lot about silos and public health. Um, that we aren't just planning and pouring resources and ideas and, and connections into one specific, um, you know, public health area or issue, but that we're taking a step back and, and taking a more broad perspective on how does that one issue and being prepared for that relate to, you know, the same systems that we might need to put in place for something that's seemingly unrelated to that same type of event. So I can imagine that, you know, we wouldn't often think that, um, you know, our, our transportation planning and our code enforcement and our zoning, you know, might affect the you know chronic disease rates that we have and, and our ability to move about communities and things. But they clearly do impact those things. And those, um, they also have implications for how we, um, you know, respond in moments of, you know, crisis and disaster related to blizzards or COVID-19. So the partnerships that we have in place then are the same partners and the same systems that we can employ, um, whether emergency or a more planned approach to, uh, you know, long-term healthcare outcomes. So when a new facility like the one that Evergreen Health just opened in Jamestown, um, you know, that one offers primary care as well as sexual health treatment services for folks with addictions as well. You know, what, what does that mean from a, from a public health perspective? Like, obviously, I would imagine expanding services in a community is always a net positive but how how like how quantifiable is that? I mean, do you, do you really not know until um, there's sort of outreach to different communities and um, you, you actually get to hear feedback from some of the folks that um, that use those services? So we will. We're we're really engaged with um, the community and actually in protect in particular Evergreen is um, a very close partner of of the public health department in a couple of different capacities. Um, so we are always. Um, you know, supportive and excited, you know, for these types of endeavors and, you know, uh, knowing that that um, organizations like theirs will be more sustainable moving into the future. Like you said, that's just, it's always a net positive um, to provide any sort of access in our communities, but in particular, the model that they have employed, um, we know is particularly successful. So um, especially in, in the more rural and remote areas, um, it is, very efficient for our community members to be able to 
you know, move to one space and be provided a number of different services at one time. You know, so you can imagine that people who have difficulty accessing transportation, it poses a problem if they have to be at five different appointments on five different days throughout the week. Um, so the type of model that Evergreen employs, it, it really is kind of this comprehensive wraparound service provision. Um, and we always um, are in support of that type of approach to health in our community. Um, and then it's just, you know, uh, they, they are in particular um, well-versed in serving more marginalized populations. Uh, and so that's something, of course, too, that we always uh, are promote and are supportive here in our public health department. I wanted to talk a little bit uh, more about this rural healthcare idea because, you know, I would imagine there's obviously the patient element um, of, you know, making sure that patients have the ability to get to care centers, but also getting enough workers and clinicians, uh, doctors, nurses to smaller communities and uh, maybe places, yeah, like in Chautauqua County, for example, but also many other counties throughout New York State. Is, is that something that you've heard about just from you know, some of the issues that might face getting enough clinicians or workers to these places? Oh, absolutely. It is. Um, again, we're not unlike the rest of, of the country right now. Um, there is absolutely a healthcare worker crisis. Um, we, you know, experience it ourselves within, you know, the, the public health realm of healthcare um, and of, you know, the provision of services in the community. Um, you know, these are jobs that are not easy jobs, you know, caring for people, it takes, you know, a great deal of emotional effort and physical effort. Um, you know, care is needed around the clock, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. So you can imagine, um, you know, what a toll that can take on a workforce. Um, and specifically, we've seen, you know, the decline in those numbers since COVID-19. You know, that was a that was a really difficult environment um, to be in, not only just because of, um, you know, the number of people and patients that they were having to take care of and the level of care that was needed for them, but um, in particular to just the, the dialogue and the narrative. Um, and, you know, they were kind of, um, you know, not by means of their own, you know, their own desire thrust into the middle of that conversation. Um, and so they were having to manage quite a bit. So unfortunately, you know, we have seen, um, you know, the fall off from that. Um, again, the, the positives in a community like ours is we do see a number of different um, people and healthcare workers and things stepping up into roles um, and, and, you know, going above and beyond um, what, they would normally be asked to do and doing that willingly because they truly care about their community and the people in their communities because we are small enough here where they know the people oftentimes that they're taking care of um, and they have that personal connection. So, you know, while we're experiencing that shortfall in terms of the numbers, um, it has been a, a true encouragement to me and in the role that I'm in to see a community of people just step up to take care of each other. And so I hope that inspires, um, you know, younger people who are in training now and, and looking for roles in the future is that, you know, those are, those are positions and careers that you move into that really, truly make a difference in the lives of individuals, but in our community as a whole. So our show is called What's Next. So I feel like we can uh, end with uh, what are you looking to do, I guess, for the remaining uh, 11 months here in 2024 and a little bit beyond as public health director? Okay. All right. So as public health director. So I won't talk about my aspiration for the bills in 2024. So we'll <laughs> move Buffalo Bills, you know, we'll move them aside. I have good hopes for them. But in terms of the public health um, aspirations here, we have a great opportunity um, in 2024, you know, really kind of moving out of um, the COVID era of things and kind of resetting um, our mandated and established services in our environmental health and community health divisions. Um, we're going to really be working on shoring up um, that the public health infrastructure that we have, both in the staffing that we were just talking about, um, but also just in 
sustained approaches to um, to our programs and services. You know, really ensuring that um, we have those partnerships built in the community. That as we see um, gaps in services or even emerging needs crop up in the community, that then we are equipped to take those on. Um, for our county and then work with our partners to see where, you know, more long term, um, that type of work can be embedded within our community organizations, um, you know, the ones that are really providing those services boots on the ground day to day. Um, that will then allow us to, you know, a little farther into the future, really work on our systems and environmental approach to, um, you know, our health infrastructure. And that means really kind of stretching the bounds of what people have traditionally thought of um, as public health and really developing formal partnerships with our municipalities, with our planning and development and the, the economic um you know, parts of our county government, um, because really health is at the center of, um, you know, the economic development of our county. So if you don't have, you know, a healthy and well workforce to support the great growth that you're planning for, um, you know, that becomes an issue. So we really want to, um, you know, support the efforts to make Chautauqua County a wonderful place to live, work, and play. So that's our long-term, our long-term goal. Lacey Kiefer Wilson is the Public Health Director of Chautauqua County. Lacey, thank you so much for joining us here on What's Next. Thank you, Patrick. I enjoy being here with you. We'll be back with more What's Next after this. You're listening to What's Next, our place to discuss the important issues of our communities of Western New York and Southern Ontario. We want to hear from you. Click on the Talk to Us option in the WBFO app, and we will work to get your questions or comments on the air. Do you have a story or concern that we should be addressing? Email us using what's next at wbfo.org. Together, we'll have the conversations that are needed. This is WBFO, your NPR station. Welcome to What's Next. Today, we have a couple of guests from Evergreen Health. We've talked with Evergreen Health for a variety of different uh, issues over the years here uh, at uh, WBFO. But in this particular case, we're going to take a look at their operation in Jamestown. As a matter of fact, they just opened a facility in Jamestown uh, in uh, December. With us, Lori Matson, Associate Vice President for Southern Tier Services for Evergreen. Lori, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for having us. And Jessica Shawnee, who is the Associate VP Facilities and Emergency Management for Evergreen. Jessica, thanks for joining us. You're welcome. Pleasure to be here. All right. Uh, well, let's just start with you, you Jessica, since you were the one that uh, had a uh, get involved and make this whole project a reality. Where did it start for Evergreen uh, in terms of uh, acquiring this facility and then making it what it is today? We knew we wanted to expand on our services in Jamestown. We leased a building that housed our care coordination team and at the time our specialty care team. Um, the building became up for sale, so we purchased it in 2020 and then began the phases of how could we make this a one-stop shop to represent the, what we do in Buffalo at our 206 South Elmwood location. Is it that, does it really mirror the, the location here in Buffalo? Not fully. Mm -hmm. um, we hopefully will get there. Um, we it, It's very similar to what we do at 206, though. And, and let's um, uh, let Lori maybe then outline that. What are some of the what are the the services that are available? Sure, and I know um, there are a lot. <laughs> yeah, there is there is a lot, and I definitely keep a list with me. Yep. Um, in our medical office, we are now doing primary care, so it, it just general practice is okay. fine. And then we started with specialty care. Um, once upon a time, we were AIDS community services, so we started with care for the HIV population. Um, we have expanded those, our services in the medical, to um, hepatitis C specialty. We actually do a little bit of gynecology. Um, and our biggest change and biggest addition that we've had in the recent year or two um, is the addition of transgender care. Um, so that's all in the medical. Um, Aside from that, we also have our syringe exchange program. Um, we have three people working that. Um, the syringe exchange program offers much more than just syringe exchange. Um, we have behavioral health coming down. We are doing medicated assisted treatment now. 
Uh, we do Narcan training. Uh, we just installed literally about a week ago a vending machine for Narcan and fentanyl test strips that can be accessed 24 hours at a the, day. At the facility? Yeah. Uh, at the facility. It's outside of the facility, so right. people can access it 24-7. Um Our biggest program that we have in the building is our care coordination program, which has been around since 1991. It's definitely had some changes over the years. When we first started doing care coordination, it was absolutely geared towards people who were living with HIV. Um, Back in 2013, uh, we began doing care coordination under the New York State Health Homes Program, um, which was a change up from the program that we were under previously. Um, So we currently have 20 care coordinators working out of the building and 20. And those 20 care coordinators service people in their homes or at their providers across Chautauqua County, Cattaraugus County, and Allegheny County. And just to step back a little bit, and I'll let either uh, Lori or Jessica take this. So Evergreen services are available to whom? Who's, who can access Evergreen? Um, it depends on which program you're looking to okay. access, um, but it's really open to everyone. Mm. Um, like I said, our, we're really excited that we have our primary care, so literally anybody can come in for that. Um, our care coordination program is funded through Medicaid, so anybody who is uh, receiving Medicaid services um, can potentially do our services. Um, Care coordination is for people with chronic conditions, so it could be HIV. Like I said, that's where our heart and history is. Um, But then we also service people with serious mental illness um, and people who have other chronic conditions. Um, We're we're serving a lot of people with diabetes. Um, That's like the biggest kind of chronic condition we see. Um, And then substance use as well. And yeah, most certainly, as you're listing those, I'm, I'm going to ask you uh, quite a few questions yep. about uh, how often those services are, are utilized in, uh, in the Jamestown and Southern Tier area. But it, well, let's just switch back, though, to Jessica here. So you saw, you just heard the list of things that are available there. You had to put together a, a structure that was renovated and available to access yes, uh, we had for to all of these. Design a space that kind of fit everyone's needs. Um, One of the huge things that was a driving factor in renovating the building was making sure that the building was accessible. Um, Was it beforehand? No, not Mm. at all. Even though at one time it was a doctor's office? Correct. The only means of access was from the exterior of the building. Um, It's kind of an oddly shaped building where it's kind of four levels stacked on top of each other, but horizontally. Mm. Um, There was no elevator inside of the building. So if you wanted to access the fourth level, you kind of had to take this interior chair Chair that was, it looked like it was from like the 1950s. Wow. Um, And then the other spaces, you would have to go to that level and enter from there. So with us wanting to have a one-stop shop kind of for everything, our patients would have had to have left the building, go to another area within the parking lot to enter that space. So it was very important to us to make the interior accessible. So with the help of the city of Jamestown, we installed ALULA, which is an acronym for a limited use, limited access elevator. Okay. Um, maybe expand on that just a little bit. What I mean, if you, as best you can, it, you, you seem to have a great uh, uh, control of these construction related <laughs> t- um, terms. Simply put, it's an elevator that moves very, very slowly okay. um, because it does not have an elevator pit on the bottom or a roof access point. So it's required to kind of go really slow. Okay. Um, but it allows our patients and our staff who may have mobility concerns to be able to access those levels without the inconvenience of going outside or up the stairs. What about aesthetics? Is that important in, in this type of thing? Obviously, you know, you, you get, need the service services, but uh, was that a consideration We as did well? a, a huge facelift on the interior as well as the exterior of the building. Um, all of the finishes throughout the building were redone. It was old wood paneling. We updated it all to drywall, um, new tile flooring. Um, our marketing team did a great job of the putting our in-game paint stuff on side. We redid the roof. We Anything that we could do in the building, a lot of the things that were out to date was a larger of the a lot of the larger expenses were towards like mechanical fixtures. So plumbing needed to be completely mm. redone. Electric needed to be redone. The roof, the windows. Um, 
the parking lot needed to be completely regraded to make it ADA accessible. Um, the slopes before- It had to be completely regraded. Yes. So we, the whole front of the building, we dug up about 18 feet down, um, built a 12-foot retaining wall, and regraded it so the front of the parking lot was flat, and then did some minor regrading around the rest of the building. Wow. Um, Evergreen must have really thought that this was an important thing, uh, important Accessibility project. is huge yes. for us. Yeah. Yeah, Accessibility that's... and the commitment to the community. I, I really believe that Evergreen has been, I mean, we've always been committed to the community, but I think this is just such a, a great way to show that commitment that we've renovated this building. We've made it absolutely beautiful and accessible to all. Let's talk a little bit in general. Just to, though we're all from Western New York, Jamestown in, in some ways, if you're from Buffalo, Maybe uh, it's not really a, a place that you've spent a lot of time, although some people end up uh, buying cabins down there <laughs> when they get there a lot. They, they find out how beautiful it is. But um, what about the need in Jamestown? I've been there, and I, I always can kind of compare Jamestown to Olean, mm -hmm. uh, Dunkirk, Batavia, these small cities that it had that ref their architecture and infrastructure reflect a time that is long past. Um, and that prosperity that was there. And I, Jamestown most certainly reflects that with a lot of the residential and commercial uh, architecture. Um, that's long gone. So what, I guess for those who don't know about Jamestown, talk about Jamestown. Ooh, okay. Um, I'm not sure what avenue to go down Well, first. I mean, just in terms of just the, maybe just, you know, the people who live there, you know, what we see in terms of both, you know, age demographics mm -hmm. and and for uh, you know maybe even in terms of uh, poverty levels and things along those lines as well poverty level is pretty high mm -hmm. don't ask me to quote no. stats right um jamestown i think is in my opinion it's on the verge of trying to make itself something different um i'm sure you are familiar with the national comedy center that has brought a lot of attention to jamestown um, and it's been lovely, um, but we also have a large drug user population, um, which it's been interesting because it's different than what we see in Buffalo. Um, I think from what I've been told, um, drug of choice in Buffalo is a lot of the, the opioids, mm -hmm. and we are dealing with that epidemic. Um, we are dealing with that in Jamestown, but the drug of choice tends to be more um, methamphetamine. Um, we don't know why, um, but that is definitely what we're seeing. Um, so that's a huge population, and we are certainly experiencing the same level of overdose that we're seeing across the country. Um, so the other thing that kind of plays into that is again we're coming from a place of dealing with the hiv aids epidemic and what we are seeing with the opioid epidemic mirrors what we saw in the 80s and the 90s a lot in that you have young vibrant people who were seen lose their lives um and the stigmas are so similar to the stigmas that we saw back in the 90s when we were dealing with the AIDS crisis. So it, it just kind of felt like it was something we needed to take on. Um, we had experience with dealing with that type of epidemic. So I know I'm getting off of no, Jamestown. No, no, but I, I, no, but I, I, I appreciate the perspective, and, I, and I, maybe it's a little harder for you because I know we talked before we went on the air that though you're, you've spent time elsewhere – uh, in your career, you, you know the Jamestown, Lakewood area. That's your yep. that, that's your your home base. But I guess for our listeners, what types of the, of these problems are unique to Jamestown? And I, and also we'll get into this as well. You are also helping to serve Cattaraugus County, mm -hmm. helping to serve Allegheny County. Mm -hmm. If you spend any time down in those areas, for the most part, very rural areas, with the centers being Olean and uh, and Jamestown Correct. and uh, Dunkirk. Um, so I, I to that you know. There might be an impression that oh, Jamestown's just this idyllic small town. It's it's yeah. it's the Southern Tiers version of of Mayberry. But um, and there is a lot of that in sure. Jamestown. I right. will definitely say that. Right. Um, 
it, it, this is but there are uh, real problems and real issues absolutely like there like there are anywhere our clientele has an extreme lack of transportation services um mm. that has forever been difficult um where in ever uh, up here in evergreen they have the ability to do bus passes and tokens and uber and taxis and we really don't have that in the southern tier in any of the counties um we have very limited uh medicaid transportation that can be utilized but you have to have medicaid and you have to be going to a medical appointment um and just the lack of services that are available for like specialty care um if you live in Jamestown or Olean or in the country in Cattaraugus, if you need to see a neurologist, you're going to be driving to Buffalo or you're going to be driving to Erie. Um, we service Allegheny County. We have a lot of people who go to Rochester for some of those bigger specialty services. Right. Um, but those are all barriers. Um, just as an example, when our syringe exchange program first opened in Jamestown, it was not in the Prather building. Um, it was with the Mental Health Association in Jamestown. They rented a space for us to do that. That space was one eighth of a mile from the Prather building where our medical services were. Now, at the syringe exchange, they do rapid HIV testing and rapid hepatitis C testing. So if they were to get a positive, it sounds easy enough to say, well, hey, you can go over to our medical office and get you signed up for care. Even though it was one eighth of a mile, people rarely made it. Now that all of these services are in the same building, should they get a positive, they can say, hey, let me walk you downstairs and introduce you to our medical staff. And that easy, we're getting them set up for treatment. So just by making this facility accessible, you're, you're, it's increased the people you've been able to, to help. Correct. Wow. Uh, we talked about aesthetics and also about making sure things are actual accessible for uh, you know, ADA uh, at the same time. What about just the idea of having a, 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 a facility that is welcoming to people who – and I know this is, maybe we can get into this as well, Lori, in a little bit, but that idea that there are people who have to make that jump in their lives to get some of these services that Lori's just talked about. How important is that? Was that in your thinking when you were putting this all together? It's always important to us. We always want the first look to be welcoming. So mm -hmm. we worked with SWBR, who was the architect on the project and is very familiar with Evergreen's kind of aesthetic and the way we like things to be. Um, so from the moment you pull in the parking lot, we want it to be welcoming. We want you to see it and say like, oh, I would go there to see my doctor or I would go there to um, for the syringe exchange or care coordination. So that's always huge to us when designing a space is making sure that from the get-go when you see the building, it looks welcoming and it's inviting. And it also provides a level of privacy too um, to our patients. Not everyone wants everyone to know who they go to for their doctor. So we're always considering all aspects of who we serve um, when designing a space. You know, and I'm curious about, you said there's an evergreen look. I'll, I, I'm paraphrasing to a certain extent, but uh, expand on that. What, what, what goes inside that, that look? It's really our colors. I feel like yeah. we're very known for the green. Um, <laughs> the colors and our signage as well as um, marketing has worked very well on our campaign, um, Unconditional. So a lot of our buildings now you'll see all of these beautiful deta decals that they put together that kind of expands on the unconditional aspect of things um, which really encompasses a lot of the different looks of the patient demographic that we serve mm -hmm. um, it's so now in Jamestown that building kind of has that on the outside as well as the exterior and you also inside your your vast title of associate VP of uh, facilities and emergency management you know, there is a security. There, security has to be a big part of this. And you, you mentioned this before we were on the air. You're not. That's not really your your part of this. But you're designing the building or helping to renovate it, making sure. How important was security when it came to that? Because again, we're talking about some very sensitive things at a time where, unfortunately, certain facilities are becoming. Well, I, I hate to use the word targets, but that's no, that, that's not untrue. Um, it's not untrue, unfortunately. Security and safety for the patients and our staff is always 
top priority for us. So with the Jamestown location, um, we installed exterior cameras throughout the space, um, upgraded the lighting on the building so the parking lot wasn't dark at night. We also use access control, which is a fob access within our spaces. So if you're an employee, you kind of badge in, get let in. Um, we do have an on-site security guard there who is phenomenal, mm -hmm. who does rounds and um, just kind of checks in on people. He's very well known in the area. Um, Dakota, he's great. Hmm. Um, so security is always very important to us, but we also don't want it to feel when you walk into a space um, intimidating either. So our security guards and our the measures we take for security are always also inviting mm -hmm. too. So a delicate balance there. Correct. Yeah, for Definitely. sure. Definitely. And I was going to say our security, like she was saying, um, our security car guard, Dakota Houston. Um, <laughs> thanks, Dakota. Dakota's pretty popular, um, apparently. <laughs> he, he just strikes that balance so well. When people come in, I don't think that they immediately are like, oh, security guard. Uh, a lot of people come in and they know him by name at this point, and he is friendly with everyone, and he does strike that balance very well. Um, I want to get into some of the services, Lori, that mm -hmm. are offered there. And the one, I mean, they all really stand out as, as being tremendously valuable, but transgender care. Sure. This is a, a, a I'll call it relatively new, and we'll just leave it at mm -hmm. that. But uh, talk about who, I don't, know, I don't want to get too specific here, obviously there's privacy issues, but at the same time, you know, who are you seeing, who's coming in for transgender care? at uh, Evergreen? Um, well, it's hard to say who. I mean, yeah. it's it's definitely in the transgender population, right. um, which we are seeing an increase in, okay. not because there is an increase, but there's an increase in people who are more open about being transgender. Um, just a couple of years ago, our, our Buffalo location just kind of took note of how many people were coming to our Buffalo location for those services from the Southern Tier, um, which, again, I don't have an exact number that's fine, for but you. That, but, but that's worth, worth noting for it sure. It was a big enough number that our primary care provider, Elizabeth Gatman, um, went and got all the training she needed to do that, and we brought that service to Jamestown Um so the people in the southern tier don't have to travel to Buffalo anymore. And it's interesting. I mean, you, you you stated it very accurately that you know it's not necessarily there's an increase in of of the need, but it's an increase in of the people who are actually coming to access those services. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Um, how much? I mean, I'll throw this out to both of you. How much then? When again, when you're putting together a new facility, and this is going to be one of the the services offered. How does that play into, for lack of a better term, strategy or, or just viewpoint when it comes to you know, how we're going to make this an available situation for uh, people who are seeking tra transgender care? Uh, anybody want to tackle that one? I mean, yeah, how does that play into well, your thought process? I was going to say, I, I, don't, I don't think that it was a targeted population okay. necessarily. But, but, a, but, a needed, but, I, but a needed service. But a needed service, absolutely. And like I said, it was more presented to us that this need is here. Mm. And we can be here to, to serve that. Um, I will say, again, going back to our history, um, we are very familiar with... Um, people being afraid of stigma, people being afraid of being judged. Um, <clears throat> a lot of people will not access services because they don't know how they are going to be welcomed, if they're going to be welcomed. So it's always at the forefront of our mind for all populations, if possible, to feel comfortable coming into the space. And I think the unconditional campaign, if anybody out there has seen our, our billboards, um, we tried very hard to make sure that those billboards represented the people who were serving. That's got to be tremendously, I would think, gratifying to, to know that here's a place where, and you, uh, just to kind of paraphrase you, maybe 10 years ago, this person might not have sought no. this care. No. No, and if they were going to, they would definitely have to travel. So, so it's a good addition to the area. You talked about the syringe exchange program. Mm -hmm. Now that's something we were talking also before we went on the air. There, some places, syringe exchange is not a welcome part of the community Correct. in some places. Mm -hmm. 
How is it in Jamestown? Uh, knock on wood, we have not had a lot of backlash. Um, I was saying before the interview that if 10 years ago you had told me there would be a syringe exchange in Jamestown, I would not have believed it. Hmm. But again, the need is there. And we actually had um, the chief of police in Jamestown, whose name is Samuelson. And I don't think he is still there, but he actually approached Evergreen to talk about bringing that service down. Because our Evergreen in Buffalo has had the syringe exchange for more years than I can say. Um, So it was actually leaders in the community who asked us to bring this service to Jamestown and so far it's been great and it's been a few years now yeah and so no issues with the community in that regard Mm -mm. but very successful very successful uh definitely had a slow start a syringe exchange program is different than other services in that it's not something that is advertised a whole lot it really is more of a word of mouth kind of service and it's gaining that trust with people who really don't have a lot of trust in a lot of other service areas um so yeah so okay very good very good uh wanted to also talk about um uh, care coordination. You were talking about that earlier. Mm-hmm. Let's, let's expand on that. What exactly were we talking about with care coordination? Uh, in essence, like a, a primary sure. physician or some, uh, primary care person <clears throat> would be overseeing somebody's uh, uh, health services. Uh, how does that work? Yep. Care coordination. Um, I always say it's like the social worky side of healthcare. Um, our care coordinators are linkage extraordinaires, <laughs> I would say. Um, I've described care coordination previously as we're kind of like the middle spoke of the wheel. Right. And their job is to ensure that people are getting the health care that they need, that they have the insurance to cover the health care that they need, and really just keep people connected. Um, so many of our folks have more than one provider. They're seeing a lot of different providers. Part of our job is to make sure that those providers know what the other providers are doing. Um, so it's really a lot of guiding people through a very complicated healthcare system. Yeah, that is uh, for, for sure, uh, people that have need. Uh, Jessica, just turning to you here uh, for a second, how much was this project, how much did this cost, putting this all together between purchasing the building between and renovating. purchasing the building and renovations, uh, $4.8 million was the, our total cost for it. Um, that's outside of like furniture and like IT things, so like moving the server over and things like that. That was purchasing the building and renovations. So when they, when your, your, um, the people you work for at Primary uh, at Evergreen came to you, they said, this is a priority, go get it done. No matter what it costs? Oh, uh, no, <laughs> it's never, never no matter so. what it costs, <laughs> conversation. Um, it's always uh, how much is this going to cost, and then we kind of take it from there. We did do a lot of value engineering. We also had some great funders that helped the project, um, Garmin Foundation, the city of Jamestown, Sheldon and Foundation, Sheldon Foundation. Community founder, the Chautauqua Region Community Foundation. You can double check. We had a a few donors that helped with the project, um, and then the rest was kind of self-funded. So it was kind of a get it done thing. We wanted to get it done. We knew what we needed to do, um, and our CEO really wanted to make sure that we were providing a space that was very deserved in Jamestown, not only for our patients but our staff too. Um, Mm -hmm. Lori could probably attest to this. They were working out of a house um, that was kind of utilized as an office space, which they were running out of room. Our, um, our care coordination. Okay. Yeah. 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 So we really wanted to make sure that they were under the same roof um, as our other services, as well as a space that was fitting for their needs and their patients' needs. And uh, job well done? Yeah. Job. I would like to say <laughs> job extremely well done. <laughs> the beautiful, the building is beautiful. And really the, the teams that worked out there during renovations, because we did not stop services in the building everyone worked in there while we were renovating um so they really were great in the process of getting it done and still meeting with patients so mm-hmm. wow and how long did it take 
oh, nine months roughly from start to finish. Turner Construction was very good at uh, sticking with a deadline. We knew we wanted to have everyone in the building before 2024, and they actually just barely meet the deadline of reopening in December. But the origins of this particular project, though, were actually pre-COVID? Is that Do I have to understand that right? Correct. We started um, the process of looking into what we want to do in the building um, in 2020 when we purchased the building. And then with COVID, we kind of put things on hold for a little while. So you, then you returned to it, and here we are yes. today, huh? Mm-hmm. How, was the, how was the grand opening? Amazing. Yeah. I kind of, I was in a blur. I don't really remember much. There was a lot <laughs> happening that day. Yes. A lot of places you need to be, a lot of people you need to talk to. But it was great. It was a great turnout. I think the staff mm-hmm. really enjoyed the building. Um, it was good. Yeah. And just to note, um, as Jessica said, we were really trying to get everybody in the building and done by the end of 2023. Um, 2023 was Evergreen's 40th birthday, um, so we really kind of wanted to, you know, add this little hanging to our hat on our 40th anniversary. Oh, congratulations on that. Yeah. All right, we're going to take a, a, a time out here on what's next, and we'll come back with more. Our guests today are Lori Matson, Associate Vice President for Southern Tier Services for Evergreen, and Jessica Shawnee, Associate Vice President of Facilities and Emergency Management for Evergreen. This is What's Next and WBFO. You're listening to What's Next, our place to discuss the important issues of our communities of Western New York and Southern Ontario. We want to hear from you. Click on the Talk to Us option in the WBFO app, and we will work to get your questions or comments on the air. Do you have a story or concern that we should be addressing? Email us using what's next at wbfo.org. Together, we'll have the conversations that are needed. This is WBFO, your NPR station. And welcome back to What's Next. We are talking with uh, two uh, members of the Evergreen Health staff, Lori Matson, Associate Vice President of Southern Tier Services, and Jessica Shawnee, Associate Vice President for Facilities and Emergency Management. Just recently, December as a matter of fact, Evergreen opened their new facility in Jamestown, and that is uh, one of the reasons why uh, we have uh, both Lori and Jessica here with us. Um, let's expand just a little bit, Lori, uh, beyond the facility in the Southern tier. Mm -hmm. You've got quite a space to cover. I've got lots and lots of, uh, of rural space. Mm -hmm. Discuss the, talk about the challenges of doing that. Sure. It's been a long time coming, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, so we do cover all three counties and we always have four care coordination. And we will continue to do that. When Health Homes first started, we weren't sure if we were going to be able to cover all of it, and we have been able to do that. And again, just for historical purposes, I started at the agency in 1999. When I began, there were five employees in the Jamestown office. We were doing HIV education and care coordination. We now have 45 people who are working in this new building, and that's just how we have grown and we've grown with these additional programs. Difficulties in the rural areas. Like I said before, transportation is always at the top of the list. Sure, because I mean, let's just, from Jamestown, let's say to Alfred, which is in Allegheny County, that's got to be two a, hours, a two hour yep, drive. Almost two hours. Okay. Yeah. And there's a whole other part of Chautauqua County to the west that you yeah. also have to serve as yep. well, which is pretty expansive. Yep, to the west and the north. What we have been able to do, and we joke about this all the time, because when COVID happened, the care coordination department really wasn't affected that much because we have always had people who have worked remotely before because of the territory. So we have care coordinators who live in Cattaraugus County. They work out of their homes and visit and go to doctor's appointments and what have you from their homes. Um, They still come into the office. So I just like to point that out because I think some people are like, I don't I don't know if I want somebody to service me who's in Jamestown when I live in Belmont in Allegheny County. Right. When that really isn't the case. We're really all over difficulties. Well, I mean, as you were talking about how I mean, transportation obviously is a big part of it. I would, but marketing and making sure that people know that these services are available. Yep. Again, you know, city life, Buffalo, perhaps, you know, there's a word of mouth or whatever the case may be that and there's a little bit more of a critical mass. You know, some right. you, you mentioned Belmont. We can keep on mentioning small towns where maybe 
uh, just a handful of individuals might be in need of these services, but are in need of these services. Exactly. Exactly. So how do you get the word out? Through the New York State Health Home Program, it's been kind of nice because there isn't a, a network. So again, I will speak for care coordination in that most of the people who come to us, they are either coming because of word of mouth or they're being referred to us from hospitals and doctor's offices. Some of the managed care organizations we work with will also encourage people to have our services. Care coordination is completely voluntary, so it's totally up to the person whether or not it's something they want to participate in. We also, just for the sake of saying it, once a month, we take our specialty care for hepatitis C and HIV to Olean Department of Health. That's something that we have done for a long time since we've actually started doing primary and specialty care. So we do try to take our services to folks as much as we possibly can. But we're talking about hundreds of square miles exactly. in those three counties, for mm-hmm. sure. I'm curious about the Olean service. Well attended by people looking for services? I would say yes. A lot of folks who have been with us for a long time, actually. Really? So, mm-hmm. I see a little gleam in your eyes you say that. It, it's just... <sighs> I have a long history with Evergreen and a long history when we were AIDS Community Services. And like I said before, that's where my heart lies. And a lot of people who I was a care coordinator for 20 years ago who are still with us today for their primary care and their HIV care. So success stories. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, We were just talking, not to, I don't think I'm going to do any health information but some of our population is getting quite elderly Mm -hmm. and when you think about the fact that those folks have been living with HIV since before we even had medication for it and there's healthier than I am let's just say that (laughs) you know (laughs) right right but the point is if these services weren't available in that area the success might not be there I would have to agree with that. Yeah. yeah. I want to switch just a little bit here, Jessica, because I know Evergreen's always looking to expand, grow. Obviously, the Jamestown commitment speaks for itself. What else should we be looking for, I guess, or could we might expect to hear from Evergreen as we move forward? What could you share? Ooh, how can I answer that? I know, <laughs> um, I know. We are looking to expand in the Bailey Kensington area. Okay. Um, we're still in the very early stages of that development. Um, we've been working very closely with the community and some of the community leaders in that area to really gauge what services they would like to see within that area. So still more to come. Sure. And we are, um, it's still very early in the process of all of that. Right. So you probably not, you don't have a lot in terms of what you've, you've been able to get from the, the community so far. We just had our third community meeting. But at the same time, so you're going to be involved in the process though. You're going to be getting this input. I mean, how, how do you go about doing that now? Because again, you just got done with Jamestown. You saw what was needed there and made that a success, your thought process or how this process might move forward? We work well very closely with a few consultants in the area. Art Hall is one of them from Hallmark. And then really Justin Azzarella, who's our chief strategy officer, is really the one that's kind of gearing a lot of this project so far. I really get involved once the architect gets involved. So right now I kind of take the back seat and just listen. And then once the architect really starts getting involved is kind of when I step in. Are you likely to purchase a uh, Older facilities, uh, older structures, and utilize them, build new. Am I allowed to say, God, I hope not? (laughs) Um, (laughs) A lot of our buildings are old. So as the person that kind of manages them, they need a lot of upkeep. So I really hope that for a while, as we really focus on the Kaz Ken Bailey project and the Southern Tier, that we kind of settle in right there until those two projects are complete. Okay, very good, very good. Lori, um... What about Jamestown? You were, you were kind of getting into it a little bit before. You're saying it's a, it's a place that's showing some hope. I would have to think that this, the Evergreen Health Facility, is a sign of, uh, of hope and for things to come in Jamestown. Oh, I really hope so. Yeah? I, I really hope so. I, I can say, again, even when we were AIDS Community Services or when we were Evergreen, there's still times when people will say, oh, I haven't heard of Evergreen. Sure. You know, tell me about that. And it's like, 
we've been here for 20-some <laughs> years. So it's nice to kind of have that, oh, I don't want to use the word aesthetic, but to, to have this building to say we're here, which again is very interesting because the first two places where it, that we had an office in Jamestown we didn't even have signage back then because we didn't necessarily want people to know that this is where AIDS Community Service is in. So to jump into the future and now have this beautiful building that says Evergreen Health and and having it be so welcoming, it it just does feel like it's it's really cemented our place in Jamestown. And it's really quite a perspective that it shows that there was a time where you almost didn't want people to know what you were doing. Yep. And now, now we want everybody to know what we're doing, right? And that, and that, and similarly, though, that also shows that you, you have become a, a key part of the community. Yeah, I hope so. That sounds like it. Well, again, uh, congratulations on opening the new f- facility, the ribbon cutting last month, and uh, you know, best of of everything moving forward. Uh, the, the important work you guys do. Oh, thank, you. thank you, thank you, and thank you for your interest. We really appreciate being able to come and talk about all this. I think uh, I think a lot of folks will be interested to hear that there is such services in, a, in a, a place like Jamestown. That's just the reality of it, right? I mean, like you said, it took a while to get known, and now you're you're very well known in the community. So I'm getting there, yep. Yeah, keep up the good work, for sure. <laughs> Lori Matson is the Associate VP of Southern Tier Services for Evergreen. Jessica Shawnee is the Associate VP Facilities and Emergency Management of Evergreen. Again, thank you for being with us. Thank Thank you. you. This is What's Next on WBFO and WBFO HD1 Buffalo, WOLN Olean, and WUBJ Jamestown, your NPR station.